Folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. It's summertime and we have turned off the air conditioning here so that it wouldn't interfere with the audio. So enjoy the great audio while I sweat to death. But while I'm dying, let me talk to you guys about how to determine the number of exercises that you do per session, per week, and over the longer term of your training. People often ask, like, can I just do squats forever for legs? Or what is the benefit of doing a bunch of different exercises for different angles and stuff like that? Is it overrated, underrated, etc.? Let's talk about this from the perspective of hypertrophy. Before we can talk about specifics, we have to understand what the purpose is of doing exercises and choosing exercises. There's probably four purposes for choosing exercises as far as I see it. Number one is easy. It's to deliver a hypertrophic stimulus to the target muscle. So if the hypertrophic stimulus is being delivered, you're good to go, which is an argument for not having to do whole many exercises and usually one good exercise checks that box at least really well, if not perfectly. But there are other considerations. You want to minimize fatigue while stimulating the muscle, so your stimulus to fatigue ratio is important. So for example, you could say, a squats really grow my quads, and someone could say, like, so you just do 20 sets of squats a week? You're like, yeah, I would, but I would fall apart because the fatigue's super high. So I do leg presses instead, uh, 10 sets of the time. So half is leg press, not because squats are not stimulative, but because if I do too many of them, they become excessively fatiguing. Totally fine reasoning. Another consideration is that you want to stimulate all the fibers or as many of them as possible in all the major areas of the muscle, not just some. Muscles have different parts. The pecs don't always work as one whole unit, especially optimally. There's definitely you know, various parts of the pecs, lower part slash mid part, and then the upper part at least. So there's at least two parts that may need more exercises. People often say, like, can I build my best pecs from incline benching? Like, no, probably not. You need some flat pressing or decline pressing or some kind of flat or decline work. They say, can I build my pecs optimally from just flat bench pressing? Again, the answer is probably not, right? Because many muscles like the pecs have the sort of multiple functions or a spectrum of function and not one exercise is going to tax and stimulate that entire muscle's fibers. Lastly, you want to have enough variation uh, for the longer term in the program. So you could make this optimal program that hits everything from different angle, tons of variation, super high SFR, but you may be like, it's for chest and let's say you have six of your best chest movements and they're all in in the same month. Okay, three months later when some of them get stale, what do you replace them with? Is the answer like not great chest movements? Because yes, you ran out of great ones. So you have a couple of months of really crappy training and then the best SFR chest movements sort of refresh drop their staleness, and then you get to use them again. Maybe if we didn't use six chest movements, but we used four, when two of them became stale, we could switch in two that were super fresh and our top tier winners and for SFR, and then we could continue that process so we never have to do crappy pack training. It's sort of like uh, going to your favorite restaurant and ordering all of your favorite meals at the same time. Eh, maybe like order one today and then one tomorrow and that way they're always tasty, but there's a rotation in there that keeps things fresh. If you order the same thing every single time and only that, when it becomes stale, you're not going to have anything else left to order. Same sort of idea. So what do these things mean for how many exercises you should use for hypertrophy in one session? Okay, so one training session, like a Monday for chest or something. How many exercises should you use? Right? Contrary to popular bro wisdom, which is an incline, a flat, a decline, and a fly and then a burnout drop something or other. Maybe not that many. Okay, so here's the deal. The mind-muscle connection, as sort of measured perceptively by the tension and the burn and target muscle, tends to improve within the first one or two sets of an exercise. So if you just do one set of an exercise and then you move on to a different exercise, your mind-muscle connection is probably okay on the first set. It'll probably be okay on the second set because it's a different exercise. It'll just be okay the entire time. But after you use an exercise for one, two, three working sets through that entire time, especially after set one and after set two, your mind-muscle connection actually goes up. And it may be better than that. Your perceived joint disruption might actually decline. Like yeah, the first set of bench is always a little awkward and your shoulders kind of feel, then you get warmed up, you get really grooved into that exact technique, your technique improves, and all of a sudden the second set is like, holy crap, I really felt my pecs, I'm really grooving. If you do a ton of exercises in one session, you never hit the groove because you do one exercise and you go on to another one. So you're always sort of relearning the groove and you never really, really uh, get the best SFRs potentially, uh, or relative SFRs, and you never really get the best uh, effects over, you know, 
all the exercises you could have done because you're just trading off too many exercises to me. It's like, um, you know, something you're eating your favorite food. You take one spoonful. You're like, oh man, this is great. And you're excited to get that second spoonful. And someone just rotates in another food. You're like, now it's lobster. And you're like, but I was eating mac and cheese. Like, nope, sorry. Next food. Like, yeah, there's something to that momentum effect, right? Number two, if you still want to switch machines and switch implements, because for some reason your SFR is even better if you switch all the time, skeptical, right? But if that happens, switching machines means you have to rewarm up. Usually you don't just hit, like if you go and bench, you don't just go hit the incline dumbbell press with just your working weight. Usually you want your working weight, if it's your working weight, you're going to do it for a couple of field reps, a potentiation set, or many times for things like switching from squats to leg press, you definitely just start warming up again for leg press and at least do a couple of warm ups because you don't just run into a 600 pound leg press even after doing squats. It's going to feel fucking awkward and the first set is just going to be pure garbage if you try it like that. That switching machines takes time. Rewarming up takes time and it adds systemic fatigue. Like if I'm squat, let's say you get an option for me, squat for four sets straight or do two sets of squats and two sets of leg presses. Bro, I'm not slapping 400 pounds on a fucking squat just to take it off two sets later, and I'm sure as hell not slapping 600 pounds on the leg press, and then just taking it off two sets later. When I'm settled in, not only is that third set of squats going to feel maybe the best of all the sets because I'm grooved in, it's going to be like, I don't have to take all this weight on and put it off. And it's not just a laziness thing. That is systemic fatigue. If you take on and put off hundreds of pounds of weights for no good reason, where you could have just stayed with the same machine or same exercise, eh, that's a lot of systemic fatigue that's going to cost you in really good training that you could have otherwise done. Now, on the other hand, so this paints the picture that if we're doing like one, two, three, even maybe four sets per exercise, there's no good reason to switch. But after about five to seven sets of most exercises, in my experience, the experience of many of the folks that I've consulted with, the mind-muscle connection seems to decline substantially, right? Um, this can be helped by down sets. So if you do four sets of heavy squats, by the fourth set, you're like, uh, I'm just kind of moving around here. If you drop the load by like 10 to 20%, your SFR might get boosted, but that usually doesn't buy you another four sets of squats. It might buy you like two sets of squats. So once you've done, oh, four, five, six sets of squats, usually any doing any more than that is like, your SFR is just not gonna be that great. And now switching to a new exercise can have a net better stimulus to fatigue ratio because of the novelty, because you've essentially developed a short-term staleness to that exercise that you've been using. So within a session, because of these constraints, you know, if at the end of a mesocycle, you predict that you're gonna be doing no more than five to seven sets for the muscle group in the session, like let's say biceps, you train them four or five times a week, you're never gonna do more than like six sets of biceps. You start with two sets of biceps and you slowly work up to six over the meso. If it's only six sets of biceps, which means by the way, let's say it's two sets on the first week, you don't have to do two exercises. As a matter of fact, it's not just don't have to, you should probably just stick with one because you know if you get up to six sets, it's still not too many sets for the SFR to really fall. It's up there though, not super sustainable, but that's okay, you deload after that. But most of the meso, your average volume for biceps per session might be like four. Four sets, bro, you don't need two exercises for that. That's great grooving on just one exercise because you train your biceps four or five times a week. You left plenty of opportunity to do different exercises on different days. You don't need to rotate through five different exercises every day. People do that all the time. I think maybe because it's just bored or they think there's something magical there, but I think they're probably missing out. However, if you anticipate that at the end of a mesocycle, you're going to be doing maybe five to 12 sets at the end of the meso, then, you know, two or three exercises is probably what you're going to want to pick. Usually two, three is probably overkill, but in some instances, three is a decent idea. You want to do the exercises that you get the best SFR from. So if that means you feel like you're rotating exercises too much, like your back workout has 12 sets in it, you're doing three exercises and you're like, you know, man, I don't need to go to pull downs after assisted pull-ups. I would just rather do more assisted pull-ups and more rows than your golden. But if you do four, four sets of rows, four sets of assisted pull-ups, and you're like, man, there's no way I can do any more of these exercises, then yeah, four sets of pull-downs at the end is a wise idea. So if you have a higher volume per session, split it into two or three exercises, totally fine. If you have a lower volume per session, just one exercise is often a pretty decent idea. You'll notice that the recommendation for one exercise is if you peak at five to seven sets. The recommendation for two to three exercises is if you peak at seven to 12 sets. Is it what the hell is seven? There's no correct answer for seven. There's some nuance there. 
If you peak at seven, it could be one exercise is a good idea. It could be two is a good idea. And it's really your call based on the best stimulus to fatigue ratio and excess movement that you don't want to do for your exercise, your muscle group, your situation. Next, how many exercises should we learn about per session? It's basically one to two exercises, often one. What about over the course of the week? Okay, and this mind you, per muscle group. Let's examine what this looks like. So first of all, we highly recommend you do the same exercises every week of a given mesocycle. So same exercise in every week of a single meso. So this advice is per mesocycle as well. So not only does this advice apply per week, it applies essentially per month, per four to eight week mesocycle accumulation phase and then a deload phase. Here's the thing. You want to cover most of your muscles, functions, main functions through the meso in each meso. Okay, in each mesocycle or rather in each microcycle as well in each week, you probably want to hit the main functions of the muscle. Not 100%, but we'll get to that in a second. So for example, you should probably have an exercise or at least consider an exercise for your pecs that occurs at least once a week that puts stretch uh, the pecs in a stretch tense position, so something deep like presses. You probably want an exercise for the peak contraction like machine flies or cable flies or something like that because it's a slightly different function than stretch under load. And you probably want an exercise that uh, targets not just the main pecs, the sternal pecs, which is the middle and lower pecs, but you also want to target the clavicular pecs, the upper pecs, with some kind of probably incline movement. If you're training hamstrings, you should consider a movement that's hip hinge, like Stefan Gadad of Good Morning, and knee flexion, like lying leg curls, seated leg curls, so on and so forth, because these are different functions and cover different parts of the muscle. And if you just train one of them, you might not be getting the full benefits. Triceps, you want something to extend the upper arm, okay, so this kind of thing, which can also be if you lock your arms back here, hit the long head, and also the other two heads of the triceps are hit with extending the lower arm, you should probably have some of both. Cool thing is vertical pulling already trains your long head, which is really nice, so sometimes that means just extending the lower arm is totally fine, but if you don't have a lot of vertical pulling, maybe you can do some overhead tricep work, so on and so forth. Now, here's the deal. People think, okay, every single men's cycle I have to do, I have to cover the major functions of each muscle. That's not true. Taking a break from overhead tricep work, for example, is fine for many, many mesos because the pulling work will do just fine. The muscles don't just shrink away when you don't use their various, very intricate parts. They shrink away if you don't train them at all. So while you may get some really good quad results for a short time through leg extensions that you wouldn't get through squats and leg presses, if you don't do leg extension for a while, that probably means you'll just maintain that specific muscle area you hit with leg extensions and grow everything else. So there's a trade in and out that can occur. You don't need to cover all of your muscle function bases every single meso. It's just that if you go like two or three blocks without covering one of the functions, someone could say, eh, why don't you do you know, this kind of function for the muscle? Why, why haven't you done incline presses in, in quite a while? So well, I've been prioritizing mid pecs and low pecs. Totally cool, but at some point you're gonna wanna prioritize your upper pecs because they're gonna wanna be brought up, so on and so forth. Now, for a good structure for the week to occur, when enough variation to happen for high stimulus to fatigue ratios and no more, okay? Does that mean you have to do a different movement every single day that you do that muscle group? No, you can repeat movements, but usually you should do it in different rep ranges because that allows a boost in SFR. If you do heavy squats on Monday, heavy squats again on Wednesday, that Wednesday session, the stimulus to fatigue ratio is probably not gonna be that great. Your muscles are a little bit used to that sort of Monday training and it's a lot of tension on the same, same exact tension, same exact joints you're gonna develop a little bit more wear and tear. But if you do heavier squats Monday, lighter squats Wednesday, there's a difference through novelty and through uh, not uh, as much wear and tear of the exact same forces and so on and so forth, you could get a little bit of an SFR boost. Most people, when they do a different movement, will either do, when they train properly, a lighter version of that movement later in the week, or a heavier version, usually lighter, and or just do a different movement. That being said, we don't wanna just burn variation. We wanna use no more variation than is needed. If you do barbell bent rows Monday heavy, barbell bent rows Wednesday light, and machine, or like let's say cable rows uh, Friday light for your, your horizontal pulling for your back, and someone's like, shouldn't you be doing on Wednesday instead of light bent rows like some other exercise? And if you're like, dude, bent rows mess me up Monday, they're amazing on Wednesday, and then the little bit of a difference on Friday for the cable rows is everything I need, then it's great because all the other machine rows and dumbbell rows or whatever, you can keep on the back burner or actually keep away in the closet, so to speak, 
And when you the bent rows aren't feeling any good, when their SFRs start to drop or the cable rows, you have all these exercises to use. So doubling up is totally fine if you still get a high SFR out of it. Don't feel like because it's a new session, you have to use a new exercise. Where that leaves us is with a recommendation of using roughly two to five exercises per muscle group per week. Okay, there are some complexities to that because some muscle groups are really kind of two very different functions and probably require more than this. The easy example is the back. Two to five means you should probably be using like one to three horizontal moves, probably two to three horizontal moves per week and two to three vertical moves per week, right? That can mean that it's the same exercise repeated over and over or actually new exercises, right? So this number is a little bit higher for very complex muscle groups like the back, but for most muscle groups, chest, triceps, biceps, quads, etc. that two to five range really does apply. It's something like two or three with lower frequencies, right? So if you train quads twice a week, gee, you could just use squats on one day and leg presses on the other and be totally fine. If you train your biceps five times a week or six times a week, you might need to do a different exercise every time or every other time, thus getting up to like maybe even five uh, exercises per week. Because if you just repeat that exact exercise three days in a row or something, it's gonna toast you, it's not gonna be high SFR, nothing good really comes of that. So what about over the macro cycle? And we've covered this in other detail lectures before, but this does definitely belong in this discussion. How do you treat exercises over the macro cycle? Should you be changing them strategically for some way or another? There's way more advanced lectures that we've given on this, but a simplified version is this. If your exercises that you're using are still progressing, you're not being hurt on the joints and their stimulus to fatigue ratios are still awesome, do not trade them out. Keep them in. I have done up until this meso, which I'm actually talking to you guys right now. This is the first meso cycle in a year in which I haven't done the high bar barbell squat. Holy shit. Why the hell didn't I trade it out sooner? Because its SFR was amazing and it's just anything I could have replaced it with wasn't as good, right? But if you stop progressing on an exercise, especially for a mesocycle, and especially if it's not like a fat loss phase and you just haven't progressed on anything, if the exercise has begun to hurt you, like you're squatting and your knees hurt, and the next time you're squatting and your knees hurt even more, then even more, but leg press is fine, uh, maybe time to move away from the squat for a little while. And if the exercise has declined in opportunity cost SFR. What God's name does that mean? So opportunity cost is a term from economics that it's the cost, it's not really a cost. It's the, the benefit you would get doing something that you're not doing right now. So the opportunity cost of going to eat Italian food tonight is that you don't get to have Chinese food, right? So anytime you think, oh, what do I want? Someone's Italian, you're like, that sounds good, but egg rolls, egg rolls are an opportunity cost. If you go to a shitty Italian place, your friend drags you to and you're eating garbage, fucking watery pasta, you're like, fuck, I'm paying five good egg rolls an hour for this shit, right? That's what opportunity cost is. But when you've chosen an exercise that's still pretty good, because like that pasta could be decent, right? You, your bent rows are feeling fine, but you know that if you chose one arm rows instead, because your bent rows have been getting a little bit more stale, they're still good, just more stale than they were. The one arm rows, their SFR is now higher. Usually one arm rows SFR is below, right? But you haven't been using them for a while, so their SFR is all at full potential. Bent rows you've been using, since SFR started higher, it was a better exercise, and then bup, 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 it just dipped below. So if the opportunity cost of doing another exercise is positive, that is to say, there's another exercise you could be doing that's better from a stimulus fatigue ratio perspective, probably a good time to thread this exercise out and choose that new exercise. Because if you ever say like, someone's like, how was your back work? You're like, that was good, bent rows. They're like, why don't you do one arm rows? You're like, uh, cause that would give me an even better workout. That's a fucking stupid thing to say. You're like, why the hell didn't I do one arm rows? Now, there is something to say for momentum, which is why in that uh, little uh, guide here, if you're progressing on bent rows still, even if the SFR isn't amazing, but still very good, if you're progressing, you're just adding weight, adding weight, adding weight, adding reps, I wouldn't stop that sort of thing. Keep going, especially if the progress is great. Now, if you could progress even faster with adding one warm arm rows, that's a consideration. So if your SFR is really pretty low, even if you're still progressing in strength, I would say it's time to trade it out. But have that momentum thing in mind. So it's not like as soon as you're like, ooh, bent rows would be fun, start, or sorry, one arm rows would be great. Don't just start doing them. If you're getting great momentum and strength, keep it for a little while. But when the SFR drops a little bit lower, and the SFR of the other exercise you could be doing is higher, it's probably time to rotate that in. Next one, 
do this process, but through the replacements that you do, stick to your best five to 10 highest SFR exercises and rotate them in and out for the most part. That doesn't mean you don't branch out to new exercises or to old exercises that you used to do and you don't do anymore. You should branch out every now and again to give them a shot. So normally you would do squats and leg presses and lunges. But you're like, man, I haven't done leg extensions in a while. Let me give him a shot. That's totally fine. And it's when you do give him a shot, try to really play with the technique, especially if you start them during a deload, the first microcycle of a meso, try to play with a technique that maximizes an SFR. Don't just do the exercise and be like, leg extension still suck. Try it a little wider, try a little narrower, try to curl your toes up, so on and so forth. Different rep range, different cadence. And be like, ooh, I actually found a way, really good way to work the leg extension that is a really, really high SFR. But that being said, when you are reaching out, when you are trying some new exercises, don't think you have to do this all the time, okay? You are not missing out on crazy growth by not trying a new exercise every meso. Most of your exercises that you do every single meso should be the tried and true ones rotated in and out every now and again. When you feel like it, you can try a new exercise, but don't do this compulsively, okay? Just squats and leg presses, for example, can give you like 99% of all the quad size you'll ever have, okay? Can, that doesn't mean you have to only use them, but it, if you feel like, oh, if I don't use this new weird variation, I'm never gonna be jacked, bullshit. If people got super jacked with just barbells and dumbbells, you don't need a trillion different machines for sure. Here's another consideration. Again, opportunity cost. Trying dumb shit is time spent not growing from guaranteed shit. So for example, let's say you're visiting a gym. You're like, all right, let's try this new weird leg press that I've never seen before. You do five sets on it. You're like, my knees hurt. My quads aren't pumped. This sucks. But they had a squat rack and you're like, I could have had a fucking great squat workout. Why'd I do that, right? So when you have tried and true exercises, it really lowers the incentive for you to try super different ones. You should on occasion, but that occasion shouldn't be very often. That if you have exercises you know are awesome, you've done them before, you're grooved into them, you're progressing, man, it's gonna be hard for anyone to pull them away from you, and, and that's for the best. Like when I travel to some gyms, I travel a bunch of places, sometimes like a weird shoulder machine, and then they have a pair of dumbbells. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna go with the dumbbells because that thing looks like a fucking disaster and I don't wanna piss away my workout. Or sometimes I'll try like one or two sets in it as a warm-up and I'm like, this is straight garbage. And I'll do dumbbells instead. And be like, but you have dumbbells at home. Yeah, no shit. And they train me the best at home and they train me the best on the road, right? So next to last, you want to stick to your highest SFRs, right? And on occasion, you wanna try new stuff and sort of thread into this whole theme. Don't do it compulsively. Oh, I should try new stuff. It has to be a good reason has to be a good reason to try new stuff. And the way you get real jacked is getting stronger over time on your highest SFR exercises, the top five to 10. Over the years, if you do this, you will be jacked. And there's not one weird pec exercise you're not doing to unlock your gains. I don't give a shit what some crazy ass YouTuber says about that. Here are a few examples. Just look at these. If you wanna pause the video and look, them, look at them, it's not rocket science. For chest, you can cover most of your bases. If you do chest twice a week, let's say Monday, Thursday, you can do incline press on Monday, followed by cable flies. Okay, that covers the incline portion and the peak contraction portion. And then Thursday, you can do flat dumbbell press and dips. It covers the horizontal portion and the bottom sternal portion. You're good to go. Quads, you could do squats on Monday. Here's just another option. Remember, these are not instructions. They're just examples. One of the many ways of doing things correctly. Wednesday, you could squat lighter. Okay, a bit of a different feel, but you're saving a lot of variation. And then Friday, you can do hack squats. This is good stuff. This using the same exercise but different rep ranges is especially great for folks that train in limited gyms. Like if you're at a CrossFit gym, if you're at a hardcore powerlifting gym, if you're at a home gym, you're trying to maximize hypertrophy, you don't have a trillion machines to use. And some people think like, I need a new exercise every time. Well, good God, good luck doing that shit at home or in a powerlifting gym or in someone's garage. Uh, uh, if you're at Gold's Gym Venice or if you're at you know Powerhouse in Sayasset, New York, Bev Francis, you could do a different machine every fucking year of your life and never find the same machine again, but it's just not the case. So sometimes these strategies work. And then for back, we get an example of pretty high frequency, four days a week of back. Monday, we do pull-ups. Tuesday, barbell rows. Thursday, one exercise of machine pullovers, right? One of these. And pull-downs, but the pull-downs here are different grips than the pull-ups Monday. So there's some variation there, which is really, really good for both stimulus and fatigue management. And Saturday, you do machine rows, again, different exercise. So we have a bunch of different exercises in this, but you use different grips than you used for the barbell rows Tuesday. Instead of like gripping the machine like this, you grip it like this, something you can't do with a barbell. And it's a little bit of variation, a little bit of better stimulus, better fatigue. Folks, give this stuff some thought. And remember, do the exercise number that gets you the best training. 
not some magic number you think is a good idea, whether that be super low. So don't make the mistake of being like, just squat, bro. Don't do stupid shit like that. Squatting is fine. Leg pressing is great too. On the other hand, don't be a person looking for magic exercises and thinking like, if I don't do 16 exercises per session like Mr. Olympia, I'm never going to be jacked because that's also bullshit. Folks, thanks for tuning in. See you next time.